morning, everybody. I'd like to thank you for joining us this morning. We are going to present our Rutgers IT Lecture Series, Volume 3. This one's going to be a little different than in the past. We are going to have a lightning uh, discussions. As you may recall, over the past few months, we sent out requests solicit soliciting IT staff to share some of their recent work with the IT community. After reviewing all submissions, the following groups were selected. We're gonna hear about Microsoft bookings, getting started with cloud computing, fo form follows function, implementing good design, web accessibility and the Office of IT Accessibility Services and go.rutgers.edu. We wanna thank everyone who submitted proposals across OIT and our fel fellow technology departments. Uh, please help me congratulate our finalists who we'll be hearing from shortly. All right, thank you for those applause. Here's the format. Each team will have 10 to 15 minutes to introduce themselves and their project topic, then explain what it is, what it does, and where you can find out more information. Time permitting, a member of the team will assist with fielding questions from the Q&A section. So feel free to place your questions in this area throughout the program. If we do not get to your questions, no worries. We'll answer as many as we can at the end of the program and provide follow-up on the event website. Feedback is a gift. Please be sure to complete the survey at the end of today so we may enhance these uh, lecture series. Presenters, are you ready? Let's go. First up, team one, your time starts now. Microsoft bookings. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Hopefully my mic is okay. Everyone can hear me. Um, my name is Alyssa. I work with messaging and collaboration services, and I will be presenting Microsoft bookings to you today. So just give me one moment. Okay. Let me see. Hopefully that looks good. Can I just get a thumbs up if you see the presentation? Do you see what you're supposed to see? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. So again, my name is Lissa. If you haven't seen me before, I work with Connect Support and um, I I am excited to teach you about bookings today. A lot of you may have already seen it before. It's It's been around for quite some time now, but it's gained more traction throughout the year. Um, Microsoft Bookings, it's a scheduling tool. It assists with booking appointments and it is already included in your Office 365 Rutgers Connect license. Um, there's many different ways you can actually use it. It's not intended for just one specific scenario. Um, for example, a faculty member could use it to uh, have students request office hours. We've also seen it in cases where students have scheduled auditions through it. So there's a lot of different ways that it can be used. I'll go over more of that later, but um, it is, um, like I said, a, a calendar resource. You would manage your bookings in the application itself. Once you configure your booking, you then have a page that you can share with others uh, to begin scheduling. It's web-based. Like I said, there's also an application. Um, and it's actually optimized with staff calendars in Office 365. Um, so it gives everybody the best flexibility for scheduling. So how it works specifically, there's two major components with bookings. There's the booking page um, where users can schedule appointments with staff members. Um, at its core, there has to be a specific service that is specified in the booking itself. There can be more than one, but um, the whole premise is that there is a service and each service staff members are assigned to that service. Um, so with the booking page, it can be shared with a direct link or even link embedding. Um, the second component is a web the web application itself where you can configure everything, the settings, what it looks like for other people, manage the services, the staff members. There's a lot, there's a lot to unpack with it, um, but there's a lot of versatility with bookings as well. Um, you can customize it freely to meet the needs of your group. Um, once you've specified the service and have assigned the staff members, then you can 
move forward and specify the office hours, the meeting times, location, and we're all in the next slide, you'll see an example of that. But um, it's actually really handy because once people sign up for booking slots, there's also the ability to schedule meeting links like uh, through Microsoft Teams or um, any meeting platform that you may use. Bookings helps you with that as well. So it's really versatile. You can do a lot with it. Um, Liz, time. Frank, Frank Rita, sorry to interrupt. I just I wanted you to be aware that uh, your presenter notes are showing along with the slides. So maybe I can switch. Just an FYI. Does that work? I don't, I don't know that it's a problem. That's okay. No, yeah, that's that's this is going to be uploaded later, so anybody can read it. It's more for everybody else, not just for me. Awesome. So, yeah, no problem. Thank you. No problem. Hopefully, this is better now. I don't know if you see the top part. I'm very new to Zoom. Forgive me. <laughs> um, so here is an example of what the. Um, bookings page that comes with bookings will look like um, as you can see this one has actually two services office hours advising um, you can have one you can have multiple then you actually have the ability to well you have the ability to grant users the ability to select a specific staff member if they so wish it's optional you don't have to do that it can be anybody or it can be hidden um, and then you can see all the available slots for the uh, booking times for that day, um, depending on you know if the staff member, what staff member, excuse me, staff member is available on that day. So um, yeah, you can configure it a number of different ways. And this is what an, an internal booking page would look like for external users. They would have the first name, last name, um, other information you may like to receive from an external user that is booking a time slot. Okay, so how does it really work? Um, it, it did get a little uh, confusing before, I'm sure for some who have never seen bookings before. At its core, I, I might have mentioned this, I might not have, but bookings is actually created with its own email address, its own mailbox in Office 365. Um, the email address is where all meeting invitations will come from. So uh, we've had a few questions from users that have stated, okay, I see that there's an email address associ associated with the booking. I see that it sends emails out. What happens when a user tries to email that email address? Um, for, uh, to, to make it simple, what Microsoft has done is they've updated the headers within those emails. So every reminder, every update, every change that is sent from that booking address, if a student or user responds to that email, the reply to is actually associated with the staff member that is uh, assigned to that booking. So for example, let's say somebody signs up for a time slot with me, they'll receive an email from list meeting time at connect.ruckers.edu, whatever the booking may be, whatever the booking name may be, um, with meeting confirmation, invite link. In that email, they can also reschedule the meeting, cancel the meeting. Um, but let's say they have a question and they wanna email that email address, they wanna respond to that email address with whatever, with whatever question they may have. Um, that email will actually go to me instead of that booking email address because I am on that booking slot with the user and the reply to is set to be me because of that. So it's a very useful tool that Microsoft has done. Um, I do have to uh, note that this does not stop a user from taking that booking email address and creating a brand new email and sending it there. Um, there is a way owners can open up that booking uh, mailbox but it's not really intended to be used for that um, but that is for those cases if if that does happen to happen there or there, there is a way to view those emails so um yeah it's it's really handy and um it makes it easy for the staff members to see any email that may come from those cases so there is an email address associated and a mailbox so let's say you want to get a booking started. Um, what you can do is, well, you will have to, if you're not a delegated administrator, you will have to reach out to your delegated administrator to just have them created. Not the whole configuration part. We do this because, like we said, there is an email address associated with the booking. We don't really have a way to restrict the naming in the uh, booking panel itself. So by doing this, delegated administrators can then assign the booking to the proper domain, give it a proper name. Um, this is just for, for helping us preserve the namespace in our environment and helping others as well. So if you don't know your delegated administrator, the help desk can help you. It's also listed on the IT website. 
Um, but once it's created, the delegate administrator will give you administrator permissions. Then you can open the bookings tab. I'll go over how you can look at your booking, but you can open it and configure the rest through the booking page. So the only thing that is needed for that process is creation. Once creation is done, then you can configure it how you like. So once it's been created and once you've been given administrator access, you can open bookings through the uh, waffle menu. There is a bookings tab. You may have all seen it before. There's also an application on mobile web devices. There's a number of different ways you can access bookings. Um, for time's sake, I can't really give you a whole uh, view of that, but let's say you open bookings and you don't see your booking right away. You can look it up by name um, in the uh, search section here or by email address if you happen to know it. Usually they're the same or they should be the same. Um, if you have a different booking that's already open, if you click under the name of the booking, it'll give you the option to open a new one. I have a few different ones, so sometimes it gets a little confusing, but that is how you would access it. And here's the main page. Fun fact, bookings was actually created with businesses in mind. So you may see revenue and things of the such, but we've been able to use it in a number of different ways uh, otherwise. So you <laughs> don't get thrown off, thrown off by estimated revenue. There is plenty of things you can do with bookings. Um, but yeah, this is what the main page will look like. And then there are many different tabs. Let me go over that quickly. Um, many different settings as you saw on the last page it'll be on the left hand side of the tabs here um, many different settings to bookings to try and get it to mesh with what your group is looking for calendar is where you can see um, all of your bookings across the board all services all staff members um, calendar is really important because that is where the staff members will cancel or reschedule their bookings not the user obviously um, this gets confusing because when you do have a booking that's assigned to you as a staff member, it shows up on your personal calendar. But this isn't connected to the booking in any way. It's just for your personal calendar to see that that is when you have the meeting. So some have come to us with confusion. OK, I deleted the event in my calendar, but the booking is still there. Um, so this is the calendar section is where a staff member would go to maybe cancel a booking with the user or reschedule it. Um, the booking page is where you can design everything. Uh, publish, unpublish that booking page that you saw, um, edit notifications, office hours, or excuse me, booking hours, people use it for office hours. Staff, the staff section is where you would add all those staff members I mentioned, um, give them specific permissions. There's a view only permission, an administrator, administrative permission, um, and services is where, like I mentioned, there has to be a service before there are staff members. That service can be uh, meeting times, room meetings, it, it doesn't have to be anything too crazy, but it does have to be specified on the booking page so users know what the booking is for, and then staff members are assigned to that service. And I mentioned before use cases, um, we've seen a, a wide variety of different ways people have used bookings, to my shock as well, because I'm excited to see it evolve over time. Office hours is the most common one. This way, uh, students can see exactly when they can sign up for a time slot. Auditions and Mason Gross, I've seen this as well. Um, you put up a specific slot with a specific uh, uh, instructor, um, and students will then sign up for whatever works best for them. Meeting rooms we've, we've seen as well, which is really nice. Instead of staff members, it'll be the meeting room. So there's a number of different ways you can configure it and advisors as well I've seen. Um, hand in hand with office hours as well, but yeah, it makes scheduling a whole lot easier for two parties who maybe it's up in the air of when they can schedule a time to meet. So uh, it's really useful in, in cases like those. I didn't have much time to <laughs> give you a whole deep dive, but if you want to know more, there's a whole page on it on the Rutgers IT website, um, knowledge base dash, uh, excuse me, it.rutgers.edu, Rutgers Connect, knowledge base, Microsoft Bookings. Um, you can see it if you go to the Rutgers Connect resources page, and uh, there's lots of examples, terminology for both delegate administrators and staff members. Um, so, yeah, this is what you need to know if you want to get started with bookings at the very least. So um, hopefully
probably I can't see my time, so I'm so sorry if I went over or under, but um, I'm here to answer any questions you may have about bookings or maybe give an example if somebody would like to see it. Um, so thank you for giving me the time to talk about it. Yeah, I think you did well on time, Liz, uh, Alyssa. Thank you, thank you very yep. much. Um, let's see if we do have uh, a couple of questions. Some of them might, we may have to get back to folks. One comes in from uh, Peter Zatelli. He says, what is the best way to use Zoom with bookings? So far, I've recommended to users that they include their Zoom personal room link in the automated messages sent by bookings and told them to make sure their Zoom personal room has the waiting room turned on. Yeah, I believe that that's the best way right now um, because there, there's more of an integration with Teams than there is with, with Zoom that I'm aware of. But I'll actually look into that because I know we do have some integrations in Office 365 with Zoom, but I don't think there's much of a way that you can edit those uh, those emails that come from the bookings email addresses that I mentioned to include those Zoom links uh, in other ways that you've mentioned. So I'll have to look into that, but I believe that that's the best course of action right now with Zoom at least. Um, but that's a really good question. And I'll, I'll look to see if there's any plans maybe in the future to include other types of meetings, but I believe right now they're, they're really pushing Microsoft Teams for those things, but you know, we can hopefully see if we can include another way to get Zoom to look a little bit nicer, maybe not just include the whole personal room. I'll definitely Great. look into that. Thank you. Here's another one that we may have to get back to folks. Uh, this comes in from Eugene June. Are there any plans for integrations for Microsoft bookings with Salesforce? We haven't, to my knowledge, gotten that uh, uh, request, but yeah, any integration that you, you have in mind, please open a ticket with us and we'll look into it. I haven't heard of um, from anybody at Salesforce bookings integration, but I'm excited to look into it for sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's another one from Abir Elaraf. Hi, I tried to create a calendar and I received, you don't have access to create a new booking calendar. Yeah, so as I mentioned, you're gonna get that uh, page when you try to create your own booking. Uh, the reason for that, again, as I mentioned, is because it automatically assigns it an at connect domain and we'd like to have it associated with different domains, the booking uh, mailboxes. So delegate administrators would have to go into the connect admin tool instead. And there should be an option to create a booking uh, through the, I believe it's the resource section. But um, yeah, at this time it's only delegate administrators that can create it. This is also to prevent maybe students with connect accounts from creating lots of bookings or things of the such. So um, that's the only barrier, unfortunately. But once it's created, then you have all the ability to edit it and change it the way you like. Okay, this comes in from a, an anonymous attendee. Is there a way to embed a calendar widget in an email itself instead of just a link to the bookings page? Um, I'll have to look into that because I have tried before, I believe, to embed the bookings calendar. Um, definitely get back to us about that. I'll, I'll investigate. I. I wasn't successful personally, but there may be a way. Uh, people have been coming to me with all the different ideas and things that they've done with bookings, which has really impressed me. So, um, you know, feel free to open a ticket with us, Connect Support, if you would like immediate assistance with that. And I can definitely look into it myself, but I can't, I'm sorry, I can't give you an answer off the top of my head. I've, I've tried it before to no success, I think, but. Uh, that's fine. We appreciate anything you can help us with. <laughs> um, another one from Winnie Ling Looper. Can bookings create Zoom meetings or just team meetings? I think it's, you covered that yeah. a little bit. It's just Teams meetings. Um, again, I'd have to look into our integration. I, th I think bookings is a little bit more rigid with um, how the integrations work. It Teams, I believe, is the only one right now because everything's connected in the Office 365 universe. And I believe, as Pete mentioned right now, you can only include the, the personal meeting room, but I'm eager to look into that after this presentation for you guys. So um, hopefully Thank we can you. see more. Uh, I think this might be the last one comes from Tracy Meyer. For meeting rooms, would you use resource accounts? What other differences would there be in configuring bookings for meeting rooms? So for meeting rooms, okay, this is, it gets a little bit tricky because you do have to navigate bookings a little bit more. You would create the, the staff members instead of individuals would be the resource accounts from my testing. 
And then you can see the availability of those resource accounts or calendar uh, accounts, however you may use them. It, it looks at the availability of the calendar tied to that account. So yes, you would use the resource accounts as staff members assigned to that service, and then it would look at the availability in that sense. So yeah, it, it does, <laughs> we do t tend to step around how, you know, what we can do with bookings, but it does work. It does work at the end of the day. So um, that's how you'd be able to navigate that with, with meeting rooms. You just use the account that's tied with the availability of that, of that room. Okay, I think uh, I see two more here, but I think they're redundant and they answer each other. Can we get a data export for these bookings? And then someone um, says, as a CSV for a custom period. I'm not sure what type of data you're looking to export. Um, if you mean an entire calendar, I, I'd have to, I, I'd probably need more information on what type of, of data. Um, you're looking for because there, there's so much in bookings. I, I believe you probably mean um, everybody, every information in a booking calendar. I'm not, I don't believe there's a way to do that. I could be wrong, but the last time I checked, I don't think there was. Um, but yeah, I, I probably will need a little bit more info okay. before you look at export. Great job, Lisa. Thank you so much for being the, uh, the bravest, the first one out <laughs> to, uh, Thank you. take on this challenge. And now I'd like to uh, bring up uh, team two, uh, getting started with cloud computing at Rutgers. Thanks again, Alyssa. Thank you, everyone. Let me to just get the screen organized. Good morning, everyone. Good morning started thinking about how to organize, you know, cloud computing into 15 minutes. I, my wife happened to be planning an elementary school lesson on the, the classic question words, and it seemed like a good way to organize it. So in a very short amount of time, I'm going to try to cover the who, what, where, why, and how of cloud computing as it exists at Rutgers University. So we'll start clearly with who, it's easy. There currently is a cloud team that is located within the enterprise infrastructure area of the Office of Information Technology. Um, a team is a team of two, it comprises of myself, Andrew Page, as well as Jawad, who works as kind of a full-time cloud admin on us. This work was all organized under an IT Leadership uh, Council Strategy Committee for Enterprise Cloud Computing. Bill Lansbury was the sponsor of that committee, Doug McCray chaired it when it existed, and Al Vasquez was the project manager for that effort. And the members that assisted in developing this program are listed below. The EI cloud team is responsible for what we kind of call core, core enterprise cloud infrastructure. We work with VPN tunnels and billing and you know, that sort of the that base foundation that you build on. We're happy to work with various groups that are working with the cloud. So we'll you know, look at your workloads, talk about what tools and services might be available to help you get going. Um, we're pretty easily reachable. There's a number of email addresses on our website for different purposes. There's web forms to make various types of requests. And we monitor the cloud support channel on Slack for that more informal type of question as opposed to an actual incident or request. The other who for cloud is that the vendors we work with all do make very large investments in helping Rutgers and all of their customers use the cloud. They understand that's the the core of their business. So they will work with you on products selection. A lot of our vendors have a tremendous breadth of options available and they'll help you go through what one might work. They'll take a look at what computing your individual group is doing and make suggestions for what might be easy things to move or good first kind of targets. They offer a lot of free training, both kind of locally on campus sometimes. They will, they'll bring it in if there's a, a need identified. There are summits in the area. You know, prior to the virus, it was very convenient to be this close to New York City. One of the benefit, benefits, one of the upsides of you know, the changes with COVID is all three vendors have made their conferences both available online and now free. So they are now open to the world. Anyone can sign up to attend the sessions. They've also spread it out a little bit. 
So it used to be you'd go for four crazy intensive days and you get kind of saturated. Now they tend to run over three weeks and you can kind of you know, take an hour out of a couple of different days in order to gather some more information. So what does cloud computing mean at Rutgers? So the, you know, the, the definition we've always used is it's IT services delivered over the internet. In a traditional IT model, you would have a local data center or a machine room. You might lease data center space. You'd have dedicated telecommunication lines going there. You'd have your own local LAN. You know, people would be coming into your office building. What cloud computing did is said, you know, that's great, but now everyone's doing the same sort of things, the same sort of ways. It's tremendously replicated. It doesn't scale well. So let's take a few very large companies, three in the case of who Rutgers partners with, and let's, they're going to build this out at massive scale, you know, not terabytes, but exabytes. You know, they're going to build data centers with, you know, not, hey, we have a backup generator or we have redundant backup generators. We have a, instead of, we have a farm of backup generators. These providers make heavy use of automation. Again, Amazon came out of their retail business. Google's obviously been an internet company forever. They need automation in order to survive. So if you're going to offer services to millions of customers spinning up, you know, tens of millions of virtual machines a day, there's no human pushing buttons. So because these platforms have invested so heavily in automation, it makes it a lot easier for, you know, the Rucker staff to take advantage of that automation. You don't have to build it all from scratch. A lot of the work's already done. What I know that surprises people is that the resources are shared. I and mean, everyone kind of instinctively knows that. You're not getting your own personal server. You're getting a virtual machine across a large cluster. But the nature of that means these vendors have invested a lot of energy in isolation, more than even the services that Rutgers itself offers would. So whereas, you know, in Rutgers, we own everything, you know, if user A uses a little more CPU than they need to, and it kind of comes out of user B, you know, that's all for the benefit of the university. There's no real major concerns there. In the cloud, you pretty much are going to get exactly what you pay for. Um, sometimes there's, there's well-defined bursting policies, so you can you know, go a little bit above the baseline, but they're going to make really sure that customer A does not impact customer B. And as you look to deploy services, it's good something that you have to keep in mind. Probably the biggest thing, which you know, is a blessing of this, is everything's available effectively instantly. So once you have a cloud account set up, you need a virtual machine, you need a database, you need a new, a, a new component you're typically going to have that component in seconds to minutes. It's not, you know, there's no procurement. You're not waiting for shipping. You don't care that that component's out of stock. You, know, you can't get a webcam because they're out of stock of BB and H. You pretty much grab what you need when you need it, which requires a change in thinking and that you don't want to plan ahead in exactly the same way. Budget-wise, you want to forecast your growth, but you never want to buy something in the cloud you're not actually going to use. Just get what you need when you need it. Rutgers Cloud is really focused on the three largest cloud vendors in, America, you know, in the U.S. Amazon Web Services is the largest and the original cloud vendor that most people are familiar with. Um, they have the most service offerings out of all three. They, I think last year I looked at it, they released over 1,900 new services as part of their offering. It's almost impossible to keep up with. They, for example, some of the more recent ones they've done, this year they're offering quantum computing. So you can either simulate it or actually use some of their first generation hardware around that. They deploy blockchain if those things are needed for you. They're pretty consistently deploying specialized databases, such as databases that are optimized for data over time. Uh, we're currently working with one of the Rutgers units that does weather research with this. They also have taken two of the most popular open source database engines, MySQL and Postgres, and deployed a service called Azure, which allows those popular database engines to you know, be completely API compatible on the front side of it. But on the back side, they've completely rewritten the storage component so that they work natively with cloud storage and therefore get much better performance at much lower cost. Azure is sort of our second provider. They're obviously what Office 365 is built on top of. Um, Typically, we see a lot of departments using this that are big Microsoft shops. Using Azure does allow you to leverage the university's existing software agreements, which can be a substantial cost savings. Azure is also very well known for their business intelligence capabilities. 
Google is obviously Google. Everyone's heard of them. Google Cloud Platform is, again, built on the same platform they built their internet business on. They've, Google's invented many of the cloud techniques. So there's, you know, the, you can use containers, Kubernetes. These are all technologies that came out of Google. They're also very heavily focused on AI. The TensorFlow open source framework, which has almost revolutionized machine learning, it came out of Google and was released for absolutely free. Sometimes Google will have lower costs, especially if you can do, so their preemption models are very much easier. But like all cloud, you have to be very close attention to your workloads and check one, each one individually. So where can you find out more about cloud computing if you're kind of curious? Clearly we have a website, cloud.rockers.edu. Contains a bunch of request forms, information to, you know, links to things we find useful. It has contacts for our team, as well as email lists to reach our cloud vendors. There's basically four email lists. One will kind of contact everyone at Rutgers who's you know, going to be able to support you. The other three include that first list, but also include the contacts at each vendor. So there's an AWS cloud team or an Azure cloud team email that are listed on that website. We did this because we're constantly seeing in, you know, it's now Slack. It used to be on the IT mailing list. You know, who's our current Dell rep? Who's this rep? Because it changes. And so the cloud team, you know, keeps those mailing lists up to date for you. So if you want to reach out to the vendor and want us to know that you're doing it, it's a very simple way to do that without having, you know, to track the churn in the environment. The only thing we do ask is, you know, think about which group you're mailing. If you want to ask the question, hey, which is the best cloud provider? That probably shouldn't go to the vendors. Keep that to the Rutgers internal list. But if you're already working with one of them and have a question on a new feature or service, it's just a very it's a convenience feature. So why would you want to consider cloud computing? Why is this potentially exciting to you? I'm going to cover two use cases, both of which have occurred in the last six months. The first involves a VPN for the help desk. As everyone's aware, you know, last spring, Rutgers made an incredibly rapid transition to working remote as well as teaching remote. Um, the main VPN service that was going to allow people in this environment to access on-campus resources is supported by the OIT help desk. And most of the tooling needed to support the VPN, you have to be on the VPN to access those tools. So there was a concern about, you know, making sure that if the VPN became saturated, staff would be able to, you know, actually effectively support it. We very quickly saw that AWS offered services in this area. We stood up a directory proxy in AWS so that we could take advantage of Rutgers authentication. Um, that service uses university passwords and we went ahead and used certificates as the second authentication factor, um, you know, just to keep an MFA on that. It worked out fairly quick. It was built out in a couple of hours, spread over two days while we were waiting for some things to happen. It's paid for only what you use. So there's no need to forecast, am I going to have 20 users using this? Am I going to have 200 users using this? It's simply paid by the minute every time someone logs in. It's a fairly low charge. You know, typically for the help desk, we're averaging $30 to $40 a month in VPN connect charges, um, as well as there's an overhead for the directory pro proxy. It's a Microsoft box that's a little bit more expensive. But, you know, quick example, at the time we did this, you couldn't buy VPN hardware. Every company around the world wanted this stuff. You know, the stocks went to zero. This is something we were able to deploy in two days with no capital expenditure. And now that the VPN is, you know, Rutgers has been up, being able to upgrade its VPN service, we can just sunset this, again, with no loss of capital or, or some cost. Similarly, towards the end of the summer, it became clear that foreign students um, were not going to travel to the United States um, at this point. And Rutgers, as most of you know, has a large number of foreign students. Uh, during some of the testing, accessing these from, in particular this case, China, they found that our existing learning management systems were rather sensitive to latency. A lot of these websites make a lot of round trips back and forth to assemble the content, and the user experience wasn't what Rutgers wanted it to be. We worked with RU Global to use a program called AppStream, and this stood up a bunch of web browsers running out of Amazon in Virginia. Now, the latency between Virginia and Rutgers is actually quite good. Rutgers has a private line down there to Amazon, primarily, so the storm, students in the dorm used to be able to watch videos. And that private line allows us to, you know, allow the web page to render quite quickly. And the normal application virtualization technologies, you know, similar to a Citrix type solution, you know, gave a much better user experience because those technologies are optimized for latency. This was a solution that was proposed. It was prototyped and shown in a day. 
and was deployed in less than four days to support a population of up to 400 users. So you know, two quick examples of where the cloud allowed us to do something that we really felt we wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. So last but not least, how do you get started? First, there's a bunch of questions you're gonna kind of wanna think about before you go ahead and request a cloud environment for yourself to use. We're gonna to need to know which platform you wanna use. Are you kind of requesting a sandbox account to do some early prototyping of public data? Or do you wanna go ahead and ask for what we would call a production account even though many production accounts do include pre-production type servers. Do you need access to Rucker's private IP space? Are you accessing items that are restricted to campus only and we need to set up VPN tunnels useful to know ahead of time? Are there any special security requirements around your data? You know, Rucker's has both policy as well as many grants have special rules that have to be followed before we move things around. And we're gonna to need to know how do you wanna pay for it? Cloud is paid for centrally, but it is billed back to the units based on the actual cost. Kind of a quick little flow chart about how this would work. Typically you fill out a request on the web. We're gonna contact you to you know, ask some questions and help you through the previous slide worth of data. If you're going to request a non-sandbox account, you're gonna go through a security review process with our risk office. If it's a sandbox account, you just need to agree to the you know, limitations on that that are listed on that web form. Again, we have to decide if you're using RUNet, we'll go ahead and do a normal network allocation, just like you would normally ask the knock for, assign some IP space to you, get it set up in DNS. If you don't need that, then you'll go ahead and just use the regular 192.168 block in the cloud and can do that all by yourself. Once all that data is gathered and collected back, the cloud team will provision an account for you. And the word account here means a container for your cloud objects. It's not a personal account. We'll also then, grant access to your personal account to that container. And once we've done that, you are the full administrator controller of that particular cloud, con cloud container and can then add your own new users, allocate VMs, do whatever you need in order to conduct your actual business. As I kind of mentioned with that security piece, the cloud doesn't get you out of having to pay attention to security and data governance. So this is part of the intake process. We do actually go back and ask you questions, you know, periodically to make sure nothing has changed. We collect, you know, contact information. So if there are issues, you know, who to talk to, but this is sort of, you know, the normal part of Rutgers. Most, many of you have done a third party security review as part of purchasing a service. This is basically the same kind of process. Once you have that cloud account, uh, we do have to worry about billing. The OIT finance office is primarily responsible about that and the enterprise infrastructure cloud team helps with gathering you know, the data and making sense of your bills. Currently we pay for the AWS and Google bill monthly and we pay for Azure sort of quarterly. You know, Azure kind of just sends a bill whenever they feel like it. Um, OIT will collect money from the individual departments four times a year. You can always view your charges with the cloud portals. You'll see you know, exactly close to what you're being charged. There are rounding errors. A lot of these things cost thousands of a cent and as they get added across the couch, you know, it might be a penny or two off, but it's within a few cents. So that's usually close enough for budget purposes. You can also set alarms if you're concerned that your charges might exceed your know, limit. So if you expect your cloud bill to, to be $200 a month, you can set an alarm if it's more than 220, email me right away so I know something's not going on. Both the Rutgers cloud team and vendors are happy to work with you to try to manage these costs point out ways of doing things cheaper, use pre-purchasing agreements if they make sense. There's a number of ways to manage costs in the cloud. So again, thank you for listening. Good luck on your cloud journey. If this is something that you think would help you or your unit, you know, OIT is always happy to step in and get started with you. Thank you, Andy. Wow, lightning talks, cloud computing, who knew techies and meteorologists had so much in common? We are right on time, so we have a few minutes for some questions. Um, the first one comes in from Dave Motovidlak. Where do you find out about those online free conferences that you mentioned when you first started? So, you know, we tend to post them in the Slack channel. We certainly can put them up on our website. Uh, they, if you have an account with one of the cloud providers, you're probably already getting them in your email as well. Um, but yeah, we can certainly, you know, the Google, and a, Google one will be in the spring and AWS is actually running in a few weeks. So we'll make sure those get up on both Slack and our website shortly. Great, thanks Andy. Uh, another one from an anonymous attendee. They ask, do we have Google 
or AWS cloud computing certifications and courses available to our students? So to students, so there are, I didn't cover that based on this audience. There is, for each of the vendors, there are extensive programs around education where we can give credits for students, professors can collect, you know, get free resources to teach courses. They're not focused on certification, perhaps, but, you know, there are, in terms of, you know, the university's instructional mission, that's an entirely different lightning talk. The programs are, are fairly broad. Um, in terms of, you know, for IT staff, OIT does have, um, you know, does make use of some training partners and even a couple of our, you know, other groups have bought into that, you know, to do certifications. There are now starting to be certification options also pop up on lynda.com, which the university has a license for. Thanks, Andy. Um, real quick from Dave again, are all the billing and dashboard functions available for sandbox accounts? So sure, there's no difference from the vendor between a sandbox and a regular account. It's just, you know, it just has to do with how it's managed through the risk office at Rutgers. Um, so yeah, all the same functions are there. A couple of the cloud vendors, there's some little weird permission things that can creep up. So, you know, if you ever find out that it's not working, tell us and it's usually trivial to fix. Great, thanks. Here's one from uh, Victor Odovenko. How many groups at RU are using cloud resources and what is the most popular at Rutgers? So I think we have about 50 or 60 total accounts split across the three. Um, there's a pretty even split between AWS and Google and Azure. It, so Azure's, like I think there's probably 30 or 40 in each of those and Azure is probably running you know, 12 to 15 right now. Uh, those numbers will be in the uh, OIT annual report when it's published shortly. Um, so I, I just didn't happen to have them perfectly memorized. But yeah, they're definitely in there every year. All right, thanks, Andy. The next one is from, uh, hopefully I don't mispronounce his name, uh, Jagar Patel. Is there any way to predict approximate recurring cost for cloud services? Very common question we answer all the time. Typically we will, we, uh, we sit down with a team that wants to evaluate a workload and we'll prepare a formal budget. Um, you know, a bunch of questions we have to ask. And a couple times at Rutgers, it's hard to answer those in terms of, you know, how many users and the bandwidth type questions are a little trickier. But we have good estimates and, you know, typically come within about 5% of what the cost actually turns out to be. Okay, great. Uh, this will be the last question, Andy. We're running out of time. Um, I know this is, uh, there's a lot of detail that goes into this, but from Faison Ahmed, he asked, for budgeting purpose, can you provide a rough cost comparison for an application hosted by OIT at the local cloud, ASB1 data center, versus something that's hosted on a public cloud, AWS or Microsoft? So the short version is absolutely not. Um, we can do it for an individual workload. So the individual workload, you know, but this answer is highly dependent on the nature of the service. We all the time do this work and are happy to do it on a specific use case. What we generally find is if your workload is very compute driven, often the on-prem can end up being a lower cost. If your work is very storage driven, often there's potential savings in the cloud in those use cases. Those are very broad generalizations and it really involves um, looking at the individual workloads, which is something our team is always happy to help you with. All right, one, one real more quick one here from Bobby Perez. Are there any benefits or advantages to go with Azure over AWS or uh, Google Cloud given the 365 Rutgers subscription? The biggest advantage for Azure, given Office 365, is twofold. One, authentication is built in, which is kind of convenient. You know, it uses the same authentication as Office 365. So, you know, from my perspective, setup's a little tiny bit easier. The big advantage is licensing. Now, this is a complex topic. You need to work with the cloud team. You need to work with Susan. You know, don't take it from this quick answer. But you, right now, we get a lot more benefit out of the university's investment in site licensing in Azure than we do in the other platforms. If you're, you know, most of us are used to paying academic rates on Microsoft software. In Amazon, you typically will pay a commercial rate and you, uh, your jaw might hit the floor the first time you see those numbers. Great, thank you, Andy. Thanks for uh, all the use cases you were able to present and condensing everything into such a short time frame. We're gonna introduce now team three. They're going to talk about form follows function, implementing good design. This one's a little different. It's not as technical. It's more a methodology of getting to the technical part. Team three, take it away. Thank you so much, Bill. Let me just jump into my slide deck. 
Are you all seeing my slides? Yeah, we are. All Let's right. Thank, thank you so much. And thank you so much for joining us today. We are very excited to be here to present on Form Follows Function, Implementing Good Design. Uh, my name is Danielle Enriquez, and I am the founder of the Data Insights Group, DIG, and the Business Intelligence Architect at the Division of Continuing Studies. I am delighted to be joined by my colleagues, Amy Purdy, Salesforce Administrator, Shaneda Shea Garcia, user support specialist, and Barbara Rusin, who is the assistant um, director of summer and winter sessions. All right, so um, similar to Andrew, we kind of took a page out of Andrew Page's book, and we are going with the what, how, and why. We kind of trimmed a few there because um, just for time, but we are going to be talking a little bit about um, what we built, um, and that is going to focus on the registration amendment or the appeals process that we built using both form assembly and Salesforce. Um, throughout today's brief talk, you'll get an opportunity to hear from Barbara Rusin, who is the assistant director of summer and winter session and also our project stakeholder. Um, and she's going to dis discuss the end product. Amy Purdy, who is our Salesforce administrator, will discuss, describe our UX approach to the project. And then finally, Shay Garcia will introduce the methodology we employed to deliver good design. All right, with that, I'm gonna pass the mic over to Barbara Rusin. Thanks, Danielle. So let's start off by quickly putting some context around what we set out to accomplish. So we're looking to streamline our students' appeals process so that students' needs can be resolved as quick as possible. In addition to the priority goal, we also look to address satisfaction and resolution rates. So now that you know what we set out to accomplish, let's take a look at what was gained. So here are three efficiency gains to share. Our first efficiency example is around emails. All emails were automated, attachments can be easily added to emails, and we were also able to add additional attachments to records if needed. Our second efficiency cut out a whole step of the process. In our old system, we needed to create folders to process the work. So now we just click and go using dropdowns. And then our third efficiency is that the team was very satisfied. So this new approach takes out the manual work and now staff receive alerts and notifications so that they know which ones to prioritize, thus resolving quickly. They are also satisfied because not only were they included, but they participated in the design of the product and the prototype test phase. We did a lot of testing in a sandbox environment. And as a result of that, the app or the application, right, went live earlier than we expected with only one week of additional testing. So we were real excited by that. And then after the application went live, our collaborative approach carried over into a change request model and the development team remains very hands-on. So let me show you some snapshots of what this looks like. So here are two screenshots. On the left is the student facing form and on the right is the back end in Salesforce where our summer session staff manages the process. So this process allows all of the data being collected on the forward facing form to be streamlined and tracked in Salesforce, which includes workflow automations. An example of an automation is um, like a staff member will receive an alert when an end user being the student um, uploads a new document. So this automation functionality expedites our response time. It reduces staff work, all while increasing the student experience. So I have one more screen to show that will take us a little deeper. So earlier I mentioned that we wanted to score some efficiencies in regards to managing emails. So here's what this looks like. All emails are attached to a contact record. In the left picture, you can see inside the activity pane, there's a red box to show you that activity pane. Everything is right there in plain sight. The right side demonstrates the status values that assist us in managing each appeal 
So now we don't need to create those folders and drag and drop files in the system. So these efficiencies assist us in scalability to future terms. So everything is already built in. All we need to do is just change the term dates. So now you're probably wondering how does all this work? So let's take a look at the data to see if everything is working the way we attended. You can see here that we scored a big time savings in our 2019 process to our 2020 process. We saved 3.75 days per appeal. Just to give you some example, in 2019, summer session received 199 appeals. In summer 2020, which just ended, we received 318 appeals. So that was an additional 119 more appeals. Just looking at that increase alone, we saved 446 days from the prior year. So let's pull it all together. So in summary, what we accomplished was efficiencies in workflow with the use of the form, staff notifications, and the overall tracking of communications. A lot happens behind the scenes with the web-based form, right? So it creates that student record and electronically captures the form for that student. Students are also able to save a submission in progress and submit the form later. After a student submits the appeal, they will receive an automatic email response confirming their submission. The best part of this is that everything is automated. Regarding notifications, Staff receive that system generated notification when a new form is submitted or when a student updates their original submission with an additional um, attachment. This means that no one needs to check the fax machine or wait for the mail to be delivered, open, sorted, you know, and attached to the student. Our third big win is in the communication tracking. Emails can be sent while in the student record and notes can be manually added to the record on the fly. For example, if a student calls the office, staff can access the record and document the phone call using a note feature. This allows for all forms of communication to be captured on the appeal. If there are follow-up tasks that are needed, they could be assigned so that we know the status at all times. So to accomplish, to accomplish this, we met a total of eight times for 12 hours. So I know that's pretty crazy. Not a lot of time, in my opinion, to build something like this, but let's hear from Amy on the hows and how we got this all done. Thank you, Barbara. So how did we build this? I will talk about how DIG collaborated with Barbara's team to produce the solutions and outcomes that Barbara just described. This slide shows how we approached our project. Our approach included these five elements, which are highlighted. Empathy, the process of defining the problem, ideating solutions, prototyping, and testing. I will now focus on a few of these elements. So the next slide um, shows how we diversified perspectives. And the, so the first thing that we did was to gather a multidisciplinary team. And this chart shows the range of roles that were involved. Communication was key to ensuring that the perspective of each team member was being heard. We also included student workers for their usability feedback, for their input on the language of the questions on the front facing form, and for information that they thought would be important for this student end user. We had regular biweekly meetings, shared documents and feedback to keep everyone in the loop. And this empathetic approach carried through all stages of our work together. So defining the project was the most time uh, intensive part of our work. We whiteboarded the current process in a full team meeting. And it was really a fun and informative way to kick off the process of defining the problem we were working on. And this particular slide we've included for two reasons. One, to show that we started with a very low tech approach, just a sketch. And we also like the fact that the team is actually reflected in this sketch. Um, we then transferred this sketch 
to a digital version. And this version was used in a meeting where team members, so we use this sketch in a meeting where the team members each identified number one, what is currently working for each role, and number two, the pain points that each role had. So gathering feedback on what was currently working well and the pain points from each of the various perspectives enabled us to maintain uh, this human-centered, user-centered approach as we defined our project goals and requirements. As I mentioned, most of our project time was spent defining the problem by understanding the current processes, what was working well, and especially on the pain points. And as Albert Einstein said, a well-defined problem is full of clues for a successful solution. So once we had our well-defined problem, we then began to ideate, to create blueprints for the path forward. This 2B process was based on addressing the pain points from the current state while including what was already working well. We distilled the business requirements and created solutions. And we then went on to prototype and to test and to, and to fulfill the requirements that we had identified. And now Shay will discuss why the framework we use for this project resulted in success. Thank you, Amy. So some of you may have heard or seen the tree swing story before. It is a great visual tool highlighting perception gaps, meaning endless perspectives and solutions. Sometimes a client could overstate what they want and in result requirements gathering are like misinterpreted and let engineers end up building crazy things. So if you can look at the slide, you can see there's like a couch, there's a roller coaster, there's like a rope, there's just a whole bunch of crazy things going on and really all they wanted was just a tree swing. So some of you might have encountered this in real work situations or projects. Well, we are happy to tell you that design thinking offers us a better approach. So there are five modes of design thinking and action phases. And the first one is empathize. Second is define, ideate, prototype, and test. There's an arrow there, which may signify that a testing was failed. And if you test something and it fails, you ideate again, and then you follow with the prototype and begin with new testing. So design thinking is a mindset that consists of five modes to better define the problem and provide a more collaborative and holistic solution. So we're actually in good company. Um, this is just a list of few successful companies have who have used design thinking as a methodology for many of their processes. So after this lecture series event, we will be happy to send you the slide presentation with the link so you can read more about their processes to success. Sorry about that. I was trying to find my unmute. My, my bar was hiding on me. Thank you so much, Shay, for um, talking us through and, and the methodology. Um, we are happy to answer any questions that you may have. Again, um, you know, defining what the product was, if you have any questions about what we built in, in Salesforce and the appeals project, um, how we, we went about it, our diversity, who was on it, how it really facilitates change management, and really adoption, which is key. And then finally, why we went with design thinking. Um, you know, it is a universal application. It is great to, um, you know, use this approach for any size problem. And um, most importantly, you know, you don't want to really design, you know, a new system based on bad processes. So it really helps you rethink those processes when you're when you're implementing design. And it's a very good user experience, um, you know, uh, tool. So again, thank you for for joining us. Um, thank you for my colleagues for helping um, in this presentation. And please um, feel free to reach out to us with questions or drop your questions in the QA. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, I don't see any questions right now, but I, I have a quick one. You know, it says form follows function. That's 
by six feet, of course, right? You are doing social distancing there? Absolutely, absolutely, with masks on. Okay, great, thank you. So if we don't have any questions, and you know that may be because we introduced a methodology and not really a technology, um, I'd like to turn it over to uh, team four. And the topic there is web accessibility and the Office of IT Accessibility Services. All right. Good morning, everyone. Can you guys see my screen okay? We do. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Uh, thank you guys so much for attending today's lightning talks. They've all been very informative up until this point. Uh, my name is Preston Radke from the Office of IT Accessibility. And I will be talking to you very briefly about the different services we offer, um, some important updates and some kind of next steps that you and your organizations can take to um, further spread the good word of accessibility, if you will. All right, so let's first by just defining what web accessibility is. You know, there's lots of different definitions out there. Um, if you Google searched web accessibility, the first 10 results would yield some sort of different definition. But the one that we in our office like to go with is from um, the accessibility thinker, we like to say, Ms. Cynthia Waddell, and it reads, development of information systems flexible enough to accommodate the needs of the broadest range of users regardless of age or disability. And this definition really dovetails perfectly into something that we like to call the curb cut effect. So the curb cut effect, it's an analogy obviously, but the curb cut effect focuses on curb cuts on street corners. So curb cuts were initially developed to assist wheelchair users in safely transitioning from the raised sidewalk into the street. Um, but how many times have, have you or your, anyone you know been pushing like a stroller or, or a cart of groceries? And it's certainly a lot easier to you know, traverse down that ramp as opposed to trying to lift your, your, your supplies or your, or your cart over the, you know, the raised edge or try to, you know, balance it into the street. You know, you'd run the risk of losing all your materials or run the risk of injury. Um, that is such an illustrative example because the beautiful, the beautiful thing about accessibility is that it does not accommodate and open doors just for one, just for one group. The great thing about accessibility is it, it improves the experience for everyone, not just a single minority or a single demographic. And I think that's one thing that we really try to highlight with our work. Um, and one thing that I really want to point out, and I'll reemphasize this um, at the conclusion of this presentation, is that we are the Office of IT Accessibility, and it, IT Accessibility is our, you know, that is our, that's our thing. That's that's what we're tasked with, with concerning ourselves with. But in order to develop and curate and facilitate a more equitable and accessible community, accessibility is actually everyone's responsibility. Um, be it facilitating accessible, um, you know, atmospheres and work environments to developing accessible Word documents and web pages. Uh, we truly won't have a fully accessible and equitable university until everyone completely buys in. And attending this meeting is a perfect first step to, you know, changing attitudes and, you know, spreading the good word of accessibility, like I said. All right, so I'm gonna talk very briefly about the history of our office. Uh, we are relatively new. Office of IT Accessibility was founded in 2017 in response to a complaint for the Office of Civil Rights. Um, in the preceding three years, we've conducted hundreds of different trainings. We've consulted on, um, you know, remediations on different websites and mobile applications. We've expanded our staff. Uh, the, it's been a very meteoric and quite impressive, um, you know, rise and output for, for our office. Um, in March, as everyone's lives had been, have been trans, transformed by the coronavirus, um, our work also transformed. Um, since everyone is doing work virtually now, accessibility was flung completely to the forefront of everyone's minds. You know, suddenly teachers now had to account for teaching virtually and sharing documentation strictly virtually. Um, consequently, as I'll discuss later on in this presentation, um, our, training, our training attendees have skyrocketed. The amount of 
organization, organizational content that we've had to audit has also skyrocketed. The amount of role, enrollees and different, um, you know, different um, training resources that we offer has also gone up in, in exponentially. And that's, that's truly awesome. I'm very proud of all the work that our team has done um, in that regard to get those numbers up. All right, so I'm gonna briefly highlight some of the different services that we offer. Uh, those include uh, trainings, uh, trainings, webinars, and workshops, um, IT acquisition review and um, acquisition assistance, uh, unit audits, professional development opportunities, testing tools and resources, and end user support. Okay, so first we're gonna talk about webinars and workshops. So we, are, we have two different types of training modalities that we offer. The first is kind of our non, or first is our linear kind of predetermined trainings that we deliver usually every week or every other week through each, through each semester. We actually have a training tomorrow coming up. And the second one involves the, our individualized trainings which are curated specifically for a, a unit or group. So first thing I'm gonna talk about the, the linear trainings and I'm so proud of my team for this. Before this, before fall semester, we were averaging about 100 attendees um, per semester for all the trainings that we offered. And this semester we've seen a five fold increase in the number of attendees for all of our webinars and trainings. And I think that's, I think that's due to, like I said, you know, a greater awareness of accessibility and I think our team has really done a great job leveraging different um, communication networks and marketing techniques to spread, you know, the, the news of the new schedule and the, the different trainings that we would be offering. Um, and as a side note, the new schedule of trainings for spring semester will be going live um, in about two weeks or so. So please be on the lookout for that. And I look forward to seeing you guys um, in a few upcoming trainings. So some common topics that we offer, uh, we, have, we have a large stable of these. They're, they're kind of in rotation um, based on need and you know, how long they, they, they haven't been <laughs> delivered. But typically, we get, deliver trainings on LMSs, um, content accessibility, so accessibility of like Microsoft Word documents, PDFs. Um, we've, we, we offer several different trainings that focus on captioning and audio description, um, different testing techniques. I do wanna point out though, that we are very much so always open to new ideas and inspirations for our training. So we always like to kind of listen to previous attendees and, and other, indiv other individuals that our office works with to possibly learn about what training topics we could potentially cover or speak on later on down the road. Um, and then the second modality, the individualized trainings, in some ways these tend to be in some ways, these are actually better than our linear trainings only because um, they are a lot more interactive and specialized. So how these work are, um, let's say that you and your team wants to be trained on a topic that isn't covered or isn't covered enough in our, you know, our predetermined linear training. So you would just email our accessibility at Rutgers.edu or email one of our email accounts directly and just explain your situation. You know, talk about the different training topics that you would like to be talked about. Um, maybe highlight some testing demonstrations that you would like to be shown. And then uh, we would communicate amongst the four of us, the OITA team, and then we would decide who would be delivering that training. And then we would, um, typically we would, before March, we would go to you guys in person, but now of course we would just deliver that virtually over Zoom. And that's obviously how, how all of our trainings are going to be held going forward. Um, so I highly encourage anyone who is interested to obviously go to both trainings, but if there are specific needs that you'd like to be covered, maybe you would want something tested, um, please reach out to us. We can, we can you know, build a specific training for you or we can work something else out. All right, so we also provide assistance with IT acquisition and procurement. So the first, the first concept I want to highlight here is something called a VPAT, V-P-A-T, that stands for Volunteer Product Accessibility Template. So a VPAT is a document that is produced by a vendor that highlights all the, the functions and features um, of their product and how they adhere to certain accessibility 
standards and accessibility standards and laws. Now, where we come in is because for someone who doesn't work with accessibility or has never looked at a VPAP for, before, they can be very overwhelming. Um, so we can work with you and your team to help you analyze VPATs. We can assist you in you know, comparing VPATs if you are working with multiple vendors or comparing VPATs, if you will. Um, in some instances, we may be able to help verify if what it says in the VPAT is actually true because unfortunately, there are many, many instances where companies will say that you know, their product adheres to WCAG 2.0 and really it, none of its functions are accessible at all. So we can, in some instances, assist you in that regard. Um, additionally, we can help you develop a roadmap for you to share with, your, with, with the vendor. So the, a roadmap would essentially, essentially a roadmap would uh, lie out the different timelines and deadlines for the vendor to update and remediate any accessibility flaws that their product has um, before or before purchase or after purchase. And then the final bit that I'd like to talk about in this section deals with um, legal language. So our office works with general counsel to include contract language that you can include in your contract uh, with your vendor to ensure that they get held accountable, that it's you know, written in paper that this, that, this doc, that this product is accessible or needs to be accessible. All right, so unit audits. So this is this is a pretty this is a pretty important topic here. I, I personally think um, unit audits involve a comprehensive um, scanning and auditing of a department's accessibility of you know a, a, a package of content or a web page. So it's it, it could honestly be up to it's up to you. It could be honestly anything that you want us to audit. It could be just a simple PDF or just a single web page, or it could be an entire website or, or mobile application. Um, it's a completely voluntary process. Uh, you would contact our office, um, highlight which, what content you would want to be analyzed, um, and then depending on how large the scope of the, the content is, um, one or a few of our analysts will conduct an accessibility scan using manual and automated testing. Um, and then we would document all the issues that we found and then we would meet with our contact person from your department and deliver our findings and provide any remediation suggestions. We cannot actually go in and fix any of the accessibility issues, but we can certainly act as your resource to explore um, any solutions for, for those issues. So like, like I said, there is really no set standard as to what we can audit. Uh, it's completely up to the case by case basis. So we are completely open to whichever, um, whatever you would like us to look at. Okay, so that really dovetails perfectly into DQ's Axe Monitor. So Axe Monitor used to be called World Space Comply. I, I know for a fact that some of you in this meeting have used World Space Comply or Axe Monitor. So um, for some of you, this may be preaching to the choir, but X Monitor is a very robust and massively powerful accessibility auditing program that, that we use to scan entire websites for accessibility issues. Um, so there are lots of really effective, you know, single page accessibility scanners, but if you have to scan an entire page, it, or an entire website, that could take hours. Whereas this automated scanner through X Monitor can do it you, you can, it can scan up to five pages at a single time or five levels deep. It's very powerful. Um, it's also free for Rutgers affiliates or Rutgers individuals. Um, you just have to contact our office. Um, you may have to provide some additional position related information like what your role is and what you need to be, what you would like to be scanning. Um, and that's just because we, we may need to do some, that's the, the, that just deals with configuring your account per se. Um, so that's, that's one of the major tools that we use for scanning into our websites and it seems to be very popular, popular with um, lots, of, lots of different users here at Rutgers. And if you would like training with X Monitor or any other accessibility scanning software, please let us know and we can um, provide resources to you. Okay, not to be confused with X Monitor, I now wanna talk about DQ University and university is maybe my favorite application that we're going to talk about here today. So university 
is this massive industry level training repository that focuses singularly on accessibility. So think LinkedIn learning, um, except only focus on accessibility. And it, it's, I can't emphasize just how, how broad and how overarching university is. So you can get trained on anything from Angular accessibility, JavaScript accessibility, to learning about models of disability or customer service for individuals with disabilities. Um, there's almost, I don't, I, I was, I don't think that there's anything that um, DQ University doesn't cover that touches accessibility or disability culture at all, honestly. Um, and the other great thing about university, it's, it's completely free and available to, to all Rutgers individuals. Again, you would just contact our office. Um, we would take your email address. Um, we would self-enroll you and you would get an email from DQ University prompting you to set up an account. Um, once in, if you need assistance selecting courses, we can kind of give you some recommendations or you can just poke around on your own. It's a pretty, it's a pretty uh, user-friendly site we found. So just feel free to explore once you're in. Um, also, the great thing about DQ University for certain licensures, you can actually get continuing education credit for um, taking university courses. Um, and with a lot of these courses, they're just, come as you go, you know, they're not, they're just self paced, you can just do them whenever they're not led by instructors, or there's no time limits on them. Um, so they're, it's completely up to you in that regard. Uh, before I close up here, I just want to highlight the different ways you can get in contact with us. Um, so if you obviously if you have any questions today, please put them in the chat. Um, Jesse Pulido may will I, myself or Jesse Pulito will, will answer them after this meeting if there's time permitting. Um, also, you'll notice that accessibility at Rutgers is located in the footer of, Rus of Rutgers web pages um, that links directly to one of our accounts where we can, that's where you can place some accessibility issues that you find um, just in your day to day life when you're, when you're, you know, on one of, our, on one of the Rutgers sites. Um, Additionally, we are very active in Slack. There is a specific accessibility channel and all four of us are very active in other Slack channels, always you know, talking about accessibility, um, trying to get make accessibility part of the conversation. All right, so like I said, I really wanted to thank you for obviously selecting this talk today and for listening to this talk today. And I just wanna, I, I just wanna point out that accessibility is a process, so. I know for many of you right now, this could be a completely brand new concept. You may feel very overwhelmed and that's, that's completely fine. Um, the, the very important first step for learning anything about accessibility is just asking questions. You know, sometimes the simplest questions can yield such rudimentary answers that can truly shape and help you frame how you view accessibility in different scenarios going forward. Um, if you are someone that is afraid that um, they, you may have inaccessible content, I would say, you know, if you can test, nothing will be made, almost nothing will be made accessible overnight. It is very much so a process. Your best, your best bet is to do frequent testing and providing updates and, and uh, remediation when possible. Um, and please get in contact with us. We are your resource. And I just, my, my closing remark harkens back to what I said in slide two, accessibility is um, everyone's responsibility. And I look forward to working with each and every one of you to continue spreading the good word of accessibility. Um, I will now um, answer questions, but I'll also close this slide, which lists some additional resources that you can bring back to you, to you and your teams. Thank you so much. Thank you, Preston, for introducing such an important topic to the team here. Um, please, anybody, if you do have questions, well, I'll you know leave this open for just a minute to see if uh, while we do have Jesse and Preston here, they can answer anything you might be um, interested in. Okay. Thanks again, Preston and Jesse. Um, we're gonna move on to uh, 
Team five, this is really moving very quickly, kind of like grease lightning. Okay, and now for our final presentation, we're going to talk about go.rutgers.edu. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Hi, everybody. My name is Jack Chen. I work for the Messaging and Collaboration Services Group. Um, let's see, and this is go.ruckers.edu. Hold on, let me try to just get the slideshow up and running. Okay. Hold on a second, sorry. I get the screen share. Here we go. And all right, does everybody see the slideshow? Looks good, Jack. Okay, great. Thank you very much. All right, so uh, here's a little origin story. Back in 2014, I was getting tired of seeing large URLs everywhere uh, university press releases, official emails, social media, et cetera. The truth is, they never looked professional, memorable, or trustworthy enough for me. And honestly, it just looked like a typo waiting to happen. Um, third party shortened URLs like Tico uh, and Bitly, they don't seem better to me for two reasons. Anyone can create those links and I constantly see these links from like sites, uh, from those sites and spam emails. Uh, around this time, I also found out that a department within the university was paying Owly for custom URLs, analytics and reports. Now, please keep in mind these custom Owly links had no Rutgers branding whatsoever. So it could have once again been from anybody and anywhere. Um, this is where my students responded. My students and I responded by putting together the initial version of this utility that we're gonna talk about today. Uh, with the help of my colleague, Aaron Richton, we found a few willing volunteers and scored this uh, really catchy domain name here. Go.Ruckers.edu continues to evolve as the university's needs change and our users provide us with feedback. From day one, this application is crowdsourced and I encourage everyone listening to give this application a try and let me know if there's anything we can do to improve it. All right, so Go.Ruckers.edu, what is it? Um, it started out as a Ruckers branded URL shortener. It still does that. Uh, it runs a custom software package known as Shrunk that was uh, written in-house by the student workers within the messaging and collaboration services team. Uh, why is it useful? Long unruly URLs are unsightly and sometimes won't work with however you communicate like Twitter or SMS. Um, Go.ruckers.edu provides authenticated users shortened URLs as well as QR codes. So in order to generate one, you have to be a valid user. Um, it also provides custom URLs with the right permissions. So if you ask nicely, we will, we will give you power user access. Um, and once again, please be nice. This is, these these um, custom URLs are on a first come first serve basis. So try not to squat on any of them, if you know what I mean. Um, this, what, why else is it useful? Uh, go to Rutgers ensures digital, Rutgers digital branding, Rutgers add you digital branding. And uh, let's see, Rutgers IT security systems uh, like anti-spam and anti-malware systems may, be prefer may give preferable treatment to Rutgers.edu internal addresses. There's also built-in statistics and basic analytics capabilities. So who's using this? Uh, like I mentioned earlier, if you're a valid user, uh, any valid faculty and staff with a valid Rutgers Net ID has access to it. Permissions can also be granted to uh, valid student workers and guests. Uh, here's some stats, I guess. Uh, since 2014, there have been about 800 unique users who have created links on this service. These users have created over 35,000 links and Go.Ruckers Edu shortened links have generated over 7 million visits. Uh, where do I get more information? You can go to go.ruckers.edu slash FAQ and for additional info or feedback, please contact uh, OSS at OSS. Okay, so I'm gonna end the slideshow. Okay, oops, and now, and now I'm gonna go for a quick live demo here. All right, 
so if you've logged in before and if you've created a couple of links before, this is probably going to look a little familiar to you. This is the dashboard. The first thing I'm going to show you here is um, basically how you can view the links that you've created. You can go by most popular to, to I guess you could say from least popular to most popular. You can go alphabetical, reverse alphabetical, uh, oldest first or newest first. Let's see what else do we have here? Okay, and from here, I want to create a link. So here's another use case. So if you want to come in and create a link, you could grab a URL from just about anywhere. I'm going to copy this one here, add it, paste, and I will call it Lightning Talks, LT for Lightning Talks, why not? And here we go. So um, from here, anytime if I share this link and everybody clicks on it, they'll be able to go to the site here. And I've also generated some statistics. Now that I've gener now that I've created the link, you see I also have a QR code which you could download and print just about anywhere, and you can use it on websites or um, or, or flyers. I've seen that happen. I've, I think I might have even seen it on like RUTV ads, which is kind of cool. Um, there are also statistics. I'll go into statistics in a little bit but I want to edit this link now. So let's say I actually want to call it Lightning Talks. And because I'm a power user, I can give it a custom URL. So I'll call it Lightning. Here we go. And now anytime anybody goes to go.ruckersedu Lightning, they'll go to the IT lecture series. All right, the next thing I want to show you here is, all right, great, now I have this site and you know people are visiting it. I want to take a look at some statistics. This one's not terribly interesting because I just created it, but um, one thing I wanted to note here is you can export visit data as a CSV. So if you wanted to munge it in any way you'd like, you could pretty much grab this. Um, this is the link that I created, or this is the site that I created for the link. and you could see that there are three total visits today and one unique visit. And here you can either print the chart or download the image, uh, three, you know, download this image in three different image formats. Uh, let's go down a little further. You can take a look at the number of, you can take a look at the number of visitors based on region, either from US or the world. And once again, you could, you know, print the chart, download the images. And it also provides browser statistics. So what kind of browser was this person using or these people using? What kind of machines were they using? Was it Android? Was it iOS? Was it a Windows machine, a Linux machine? And refers. So what site were they on when they clicked on this link? Okay, let's go back to the dashboard here. All right. Um, now I also wanted to show you, you could download these, um, these search results, uh, but not search results, but basically download a CSV file of all the links that you've created in the past as well also for your data purposes. Um, next thing I wanted to talk about is organizations. Now organizations is a new feature. It's a product of a previous focus group and uh, we're in the final stages of collecting feedback on this feature. So if you're interested in being part uh, of this, definitely let me know what you think. Um, and also if you wanna be part of any you know, future focus groups, please contact us, uh, OSS at OSS, or just in the chat room. Let's see, so organizations, what is it? I kind of look at it as a buddy list. Um, you know what, let's create it, let's create a buddy list. Buddies, okay, I'm gonna create this here. And right off the bat, you can look at the statistics. Right now it's just me. These are my visitors. Once again, I could download the visitor data here. Um, not terribly interesting yet. Uh, let me see if I can add a member here. I can either choose to make him an administrator or not. Uh, it doesn't look like Alex has created any links yet. That's okay. I have another organization here I could show you. Um, okay, this organization has myself, my colleague, Basil Komech and Brian Lineski. And here we go. So here's some actual live data here. And also where these visitors are coming from, US and the world. 
There we go. We got two visitors from the UK. Now, if I decided to change my view over here to the messaging and collaboration services group and take a look at the decreasing visits to see who is the most popular one, I have this link here from Basil, who has 483 visits. And take a look, you can see unique visits, uh, total visits. But something else I wanted to show you is if I, want, if I were to highlight a stretch of time, you can zoom in and take a look at it the stats from here, also US and the world, and browser statistics as well. Um, that's pretty much all I have here. If you have any other questions, please feel free to you know, look, at, look it up on the FAQ. And if we don't have any answers there, or if you have any bug reports or some feature requests, please feel free to contact us at OSS at OSS. Um, You know, definitely let us know how we can improve this application. Uh, you know, this is this is for you guys. This is for the university, and uh, I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Need to unmute. Thank you, Jack. Appreciate your presentation. I do have a couple of questions here. Um, the first one is from uh, Sharish Prazeris. Will query strings ever be supported by go.rutgers.edu? Query strings. Yeah, so I'm gonna jump in. Uh, Jack asked for some of the moderation for the Q and A. Uh, query strings, I know we have as uh, we've heard that feedback in some, previously, and it is on the roadmap. Um, I'm not recalling a time estimate off the top of my head, but I know we're looking into that for the future. Thanks, Aaron. Sorry, I should have introduced Aaron Richton. No, no Aaron is Jack's colleague, and he's here to help with questions today. Um, the next question comes in from Rodney. Says, I tried to make a link shortener site many years ago and gave up when I found out other servers actively blocked any link shortening service. Has there been any problems since go.ruckers.edu's inception with this? Yeah, I mean, Jack did sort of touch on that during the slides that those link shorteners out in the world have serious issues with reputation. They're very popular with scammers. And we have seen that Go Ruckers and in general, the Ruckers domain tends to have better uh, spam treatment. So although there have been like any IT service, there certainly are occasional uh, security incidents. Uh, they're few and far between compared to the commercial link vendors. And we've actually had much better deliverability and inbox placement with go.ruckers over the years. It's one of the key features. All right. Uh, another one for you, uh, Aaron, from Antonio Barrera. Is there an API to add or manage links? So that's not something that we are offering directly at this time. Uh, again, if there's sufficient interest, that's something we could uh, look into adding for the roadmap moving forward. But at this point, it's primarily a web-based tool. Thank you. Uh, I have another one from Sharish. Are all my links viewable by anyone in my organization? That is, can I set specific links? It's bouncing around on me. Uh, I think I lost the rest. Yeah, of the I think I understand the gist of it, though. So it's uh, the and the answer is yes. For now, the organization is just sort of a flat hierarchy. You know, all of messaging is messaging, uh, you know, making more complex access control. I certainly can understand the case for that. That's the sort of stuff that we're talking through in some of our past and probably our future focus groups as well to see, you know, what sort of where do we strike that balance between functions and complexity for the university there? Thanks, Aaron. One from an anonymous attendee, custom URLs available to power users. Are we talking subdomains, paths, or both? Uh, so by default, we act similar to the commercial vendors in that you'll get a completely random string, you know, B0, Q5, YY. When you have power user that you're sort of vetted as a university communications staff. We let you come, as Jack mentioned, first come, first serve, to actually put that custom string like slash lightning talk. Um, what you link to on the far end can be any valid address, any depth, any domain. We don't mind that. Uh, it is all under go.ruckers edge. You are not supporting any custom branding within that at this point. Thank you. The next two weren't questions, just a 
thank you for your service. And that comes from Sean Glasgow and Jason Pappas. Both say they use it extensively. Uh, the next question I have here is Bobby Perez says, is there a way in statistics to see which creatives, poster, flyer, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, performs best to get better platform analysis in addition to just web browsers? So the current analytics has support for the HTTP referrer, which will handle many of those creatives. I don't know, 100%. Um, organic from a poster versus flyer, that might be a bit complex. You might want to make separate campaigns for those separate print media because you're not going to have any interactive there. But uh, you can get some basic addressing of that through the referrer header. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, it looks like this might be the last one it's from Bobby again. Can tracking IDs be added to the link after shrinking it? So I think that would sort of go back to the first question we got in terms of supporting longer query strings. And I think what might be good, to, Jack mentioned, you know, we are looking for feedback. This is now a product we're doing focus groups on ongoing. And I think what might be good for the community would be if we know what is being used in terms of technology for your analytics, what would work with that? Do we need to look at query strings? Do we need to look at sort of subpaths? What sort of technologies do we need exactly to enable that? But certainly the query strings is already on the roadmap. And if there's other technologies, let's let's hear about it. Okay, thanks, Aaron. Like we've said, any other questions that come in, they'll be answered after, or you can see them up on the, uh, the URL. I'd like to thank uh, Team 5. It's a great bit of information. I'm so glad that Go Rutgers is not just for the athletics department. It's for all of Rutgers. I appreciate that. We are RU. So again, I'd like to thank all five of the teams for participating today. Um, I know it was a, you know, no one really know, knew what to expect. I hope we found this as a, a safe place to share what we're doing across the university with one another, um, all the different IT groups. I am hoping that this will lead to more people putting in to share their lightning talks going forward. And what we'd also like you to do is to take the survey and uh, tell us which lightning talks you may want to see grow into an IT lecture series talk where there, you know, we present more information about any given topic. The idea here is to just, you know, get your appetite wet with a bunch of different things that's going around on the university. And, uh, you know, perhaps then we can, you know, find some things that we need to delve into deeper. Um, like I said here, the, the next uh, IT lecture series number four is coming soon. The topic is yet to be determined. It will definitely be after the holiday break. There's some additional resources for you here. The, the go.rutgers link our website, email if you have any questions. And um, I want to let uh, everybody who participated today know that we will be providing a inaugural gift for you. So we, we haven't completed it yet. It should be something just, you know, uh, stating that you participated in this event, something that you could put on your desk or as part of your virtual background going forward. But again, just a small gift, thanking you for you know, putting yourself out there for, you know, in front of 200 plus peers of yours and uh, keeping this lecture series alive. If there's no other questions, I would like to again, thank everybody. Have a great Thanksgiving holiday. And 